Hello. Episode 20 of AS for Architecture is a two-for-one special with Morris Mitchell and Bo Tang speaking about their book, Loose Fit City, The Contribution of Bottom-Up Architecture to Urban Design and Planning, published by Routledge in 2017. The way we approach the role of the architect in that situation is to say it's threefold. First of all, architect is a detective. So you go into a situation and you find out what's going on. Uh, you understand what local resources there are, what uh, what people's ambitions are, what the local climate is, etc, etc, etc. That's the first role. And then you put together a story or a narrative, architect as narrator, which you uh, you don't impose that on people, you, you, you suggest it and, and uh, people then will change it and uh, say, no, it's not like this, it's like that. And this is the implications and so forth. And then finally, the third role is architect as maker. So that they're having involved everybody in, in debate and discussion and deliberation, you decide what to do next and you help to implement that. A is for Architecture, a podcast about architecture, buildings, urban culture and space. Hello and welcome to another episode of A is for Architecture. I'm talking today to Morris Mitchell and Bo Tang. Uh, Morris and Bo, thank you for being here. Would you introduce yourselves, please? Bo, do you want to start? Uh, sure. Although I think it may be more appropriate if you do. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Okay, so uh, I'm uh, Emeritus Professor of Architecture at London Met Metropolitan University. Um, so I've just retired. So I've had um, a whole uh, a whole career in uh, both the practice and the teaching of architecture. Uh -huh. uh, I don't know um, quite how much I should more I should be saying. Ambrose, but um... no, no, for sure. So we said before we started recording, you came down from Leeds, you went to the AA, and then you went into practice. That's right. Well, then I I um, worked for a housing association to do my part three. Uh, then I spent about ten years in various work in Africa, mostly in shanty towns. Um, and then I spent the following ten years, the eighties, um, partly working as hands-on builder, but designing at the same time. Uh, then I was asked to design more than I could build. So I became a pretty conventional practice uh, in, in, in South London, mostly doing conversions, but some bigger stuff. Um, and then I got asked to teach at the Bartlett and then um, at Oxford Brooks. And then finally at London Met, I was asked to teach there. So then I, I had a half post from about 1990 and my <clears throat> professorship in about 2006, something like that, maybe a bit later. Um, and uh, most of the work uh, when I had a diploma studio from 2000 was in various, uh, we used to take, we take our students to in India, Nepal, um, we've had projects in West Africa, um, and currently we're obsessed with Athens, which um, where all the um, change is happening on the edge of Europe. And in all, all the cases we've been looking at um, an approach of which we call loose fit architecture um rather than uh trying to master plan uh, the future we try to engage everybody in the rapidly changing situation um with the changes so that it's dynamic uh it isn't planned it is a compass direction more than a, a master plan um and we and the students go back for in each location for perhaps two or three years so we explore what might happen and we then have a, an imaginary uh, which is negotiated and discussed and, and changing with, with people who live and work there. And, and that then makes a contribution to the discourse locally, make everything more transparent. And if we're very lucky, out comes a small life project, which we can learn even more from. And on that basis, often we have PhD students following those life projects through um, to completion. So that's uh, that's me. That's brilliant. Um, so that makes sense. So... You see, it is important that we do this because the fact that you went and worked in informal settlements in Africa and you continue to to work in that way kind of explains why loose fit, because it's a kind of counter. And I don't want to, um, Bo, we will come to you, I promise, but it kind of makes sense of that whole kind of objective, which is, it's kind of radical, really, I suppose. Well, I, I mean, I think architecture has come to be rather narrow discipline. Um, and um, was, it, was it when you started? Uh, less so, but increasingly so, uh, I think. And, um, I, I, you know, modernism 
uh, cemented everything in place um, and told you what architecture was. And um, it, 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 was, it was a particular time. I mean, all periods have a particular um, characteristic. And it just seemed to me that it didn't really provide the opportunity um, for neighborhood scale uh, engagement in what was going to go on and um it um and and, and all these participation b- became selling for developers and it became more and more i mean i get became more and more cynical about the whole process and uh, and i found that i learned a lot more by working in uh informal settlements and shanty towns where things were more uh, real and and sharp and and change could was happening very effectively um and people were engaged with what was going on. And, and, and that's where I learnt um, quite a lot anyway. Yeah, for sure. Bo, it's your turn. Who are you and where do you come from? No, that, <laughs> that's just a line from a blind date under Scylla Black. Great program. I remember. <laughs> um, thank you for inviting us. Um, it's, it's really, you know, I really enjoy your podcasts and particularly the fact that they speak to students, you know, um, something that sometimes can be quite difficult in architecture. Um, But I think um, just following on the discussion that's uh, sort of started, it's a good point for me to introduce myself. Um, The first part of my, I suppose, entry into architectural education uh, was quite straightforward, Um, but it was a struggle and I always felt like I didn't really understand it, felt, somewhat removed from from the way it was being taught in my degree um and it was only when I met Morris when I joined London Met and joined his unit um unit six in 2006 that I find it, it opened up a whole new world of of architecture to me that I finally felt I understood it was it was a completely different way of um of learning of understanding architecture, of doing it, I felt. Um, and so I suppose um, I'm a lifelong learner. I, I joined Morris's unit in, in 2006 and I never left. <laughs> and I'm still here trying to uh, take over from Morris, who has unfortunately departed the academic environment. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, desperately trying to fill his shoes, but not obviously. Um, and I think I do this because I've, you know, in the last, I suppose, close to two decades that we've known each other, I felt I've learned so much and enjoyed that process so immensely that I owe it to the future generations of students to continue to do that and to try and give them those opportunities um, that I had. And I was really privileged in that sense of just being lucky at the right time um, to be presented with um, opportunities that I could take. Um, and equally, I feel that I learn so much from my students, mm-hmm. um, and that's I, that's what keeps me here. You know, keeps me here at London Met seventeen years later. Um, I, I feel like I found my home. Mm. The London Met does have that rather rather have that reputation, which is quite a lovely thing. Um, I want so we're talking about your really lovely interesting um, book, Loose Fit City, The Contribution of Bottom-Up Architecture to Urban Design and Planning, which you co-authored in, when was it? 2017, mm-hmm. um, published by Routledge. And it's, yeah, it's beautifully illustrated. It's very interesting and it, and it's, and it sort of spans the world, like globally, mm-hmm. an, architecture, an architectural discourse that has, has relevance and, and location points in a global context, which is really amazing. But I wondered if we could start by defining loose fit. So I think Morris has kind of touched on this already um, in this approach that you've taken. Uh, sort of defining loose fit and and I suppose the problematic that it is addressing, because I think that's critical to it. Like how how, how are you interpreting the current condition such that loose fit becomes the answer? I'll have a go at that. Um, I, I guess... First of all, if you compare it with its opposite, which is tight fit, um, and uh, if if you imagine that you were to wear clothes for a for a dance, um, which uh, and and everything, and, and but once you come outside that dance, walking on stilettos and wearing these funny clothes that make you cold, uh, are totally inappropriate. 
So you, in modernism, it seems to me, designs something for precisely for a condition, um, and particularly if the stuff is made in a factory. And when you when when you come out of that condition, it it fails completely. It may be better than loose fit for that very precise descript, uh, definition of, of of a situation, but once you get out of it, um, it isn't. It's it, it's precise. It's 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 too precise. It's it's quite vain, and it it, it defends itself um, by being uh, vain. Um, loose fit, on the other hand, tries to address this issue, which I, I'm, I'm I'm suggesting that modernism. Um, deals with space, the three dimensions of space, and and, and deal, gives only lip service to the dimension of time, um, and and yet time is is in, it's speeding up in many ways, and and change is, is is speeding up, and if architects want to be relevant to that change, they um, need to bring in that dimension of time, and if you go back to that ancient tome Gideon, space, time, and architecture, um, it, it was sort of realised also in the mid modernism or even early modernism that time was was part of architecture not outside of it but modernism seems to have neglected that so uh, if you move on a little from that idea of taking in space um they there you, you it, the, we propose the proposition that architecture is infrastructure for dwelling or for living um and that living is like a performance so there's now two parts to that there's there's architecture as infrastructure, which will support change, and uh, architecture as uh, performance within that infrastructure. Um, and so uh, w the way we approach the role of the architect in that situation is to say it's threefold. First of all, architecture is a detective. So you go into a situation and you find out what's going on. Uh, you understand what local resources there are, what uh, what people's ambitions are, uh, what the local climate is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's the first role. And then you uh, put together a story or a narrative, architecture's narrator, um, which you um, uh, you don't impose that on people. You, you, you suggest it and, and uh, people then will change it. Uh, say no, it's not like this. It's like that, and this is the implications, and so forth. And then finally, the third role is architecture's maker. So that they, you then, um, we, having involved everybody in in debate and discussion and deliberation, you decide what to do next, and you help to implement that. Uh, at the, I'm talking about the neighbourhood level, but it can be at other scales as well. Um, and so, any proposition clearly has to be loose enough for some change within that proposition to, to accommodate pe different people's uh, ambitions, a diff a diff uh, difference. In fact, the, uh, we were sort of welcome dispute, we call it agon, as in agony, the Greek word agon, uh, is, is where people are most creative, where they're arguing things that matter to them. And if you can reach some sort of accommodation where most people are happy, then you've got something that fits that for that moment and hopefully will fit for a little while in, in the future. Um, so uh, I'm really losing my thread, but I hope that's a start to explain. No, 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 that's really good, Bo. <laughs> yeah, no, I, um, just to add to what Morris has said, I suppose I would um, define loose fit as um, bringing together different intentions or, or allowing them to come together um, in a way that uh, more than one party is you know, able to contribute to the conversation, to the decision-making process, to have a voice um, across scale, across time, um, to try and come to an understanding of shared matters of concern that may then lead to a, a civic assembly, um, if we're talking about loose written in the sense of the city. Um, and and the three roles that Morris mentioned of the architect as um, um, detective, narrator and craftsman is something that uh, we, we first introduced in Learning from Delhi, which was our first um, book um, in 2010. And Loose Fit City really takes forward uh, these ideas um, and further and, and brings in this, um, I suppose, the, the importance of Loose, of Loose Fit in the civic context is what we were trying to address with this book. Um, the notion of Loose Fit, um, you know, Morris is sort of obsessed I'd say in the, in the nicest way possible um about this ever since I I, I knew him I I met him and um he had his, his um inaugural lecture was called Loose Fit um so the book 
has been a long time coming, um, but it combines, um, it sort of includes, as you said, it, it's sort of global and, and there's first-hand material um, from projects that span a number of decades um, from Morris's, um, you know, um, early days of working in Ghana and Sudan um, to more recent live projects that we've done together um, that we carried out in India and Sierra Leone um, about 10 years ago um, with students, which is, is the important part is that the, the students have become an integral part of that process. Um, I mean, how, what does it practically look like? This, this threefold, I love things that are threefold, but th this threefold approach of, of um, detective, narrator and craftsman is, is but what, how does that actually work? Because one of, when we, when we were preparing for this, sharing ideas and contesting each other's interpretations of what was being said in the book, um, which was a real privilege, by the way, um, and and um, very enjoyable because because otherwise it's just my interpretation and who the hell am I? Um, but but there's um, yeah I'm just kind of keen to better understand actually what this looks like. So what did it look like in Africa? What did it look like in Ghana and Sudan? How does it how does it occur now? Because so in our in our d initial discussions, my my con my um, I suggested that architect, the point of an architect, the point of professional knowledge is to create discrete objects. That's what we do. And that's why we're employed. So how on earth does this operate? Um, okay, there are various things uh, that, that, that provokes. Um, uh, the, how does it look like, first of all, I, I suppose the, uh, the, the incarnation that we get from the studio is that what I sort of described already, which is that we will go with students and uh, with a sort of vertical arrangement from degree to diploma to masters and uh, and so forth, and they will all go to this location, which is perhaps a mile, two miles square, um, and do the detective bit on that, mm -hmm. uh, and, and then um, the, the proposals will be part of the studio work. Um, and, and, and they'll be as many as there are students. And, and, and then we'll, we'll um, attempt to uh, go backwards and forwards with the area because we usually try and link up to a, a local NGO that's very much local, not a large one, but one that's based in the area. And they will come back to us and they will tell us we're wrong, it's more this. And, and gradually we have an imaginary, which is another word, another jargon thing we use, um, uh, of... of um, what could be possible sometimes it's a collection of different schemes and put together in, in that neighborhood area um and uh, and then and then if you have a phd student they will take on that uh role um, and they will uh, go and come in other words they will go when they're needed and come away when they're not and so that as that process evolves so that then for instance uh one of them was um uh a, a, a school in uh navi mumbai uh, which um, we, we we first went there, or both of us went there with Shamoon, her colleague, um, and we're thinking that we were going to do an eye clinic because that's what a, a, a large NGO had said that they need. When we got there, we found they didn't need an eye clinic. They solved the eye problems there already. What they needed was a primary school. Um, so, so um, and and there was uh, the, 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 there wasn't the... Um, materials for that there wasn't the funding for that uh, but eventually we uh, negotiated with uh, the mine owner we've got some money from outside we got to found out what the local materials are and what local skills there were mm -hmm. and and a and, and, and a, a, a one-room classroom was built um right next to a um hindu temple a very very small place there was a, a, a in the center of this really temporary settlement because it was just quarry workers who were there temporarily <laughs> mining stone for the road, um, uh, but it became a permanent settlement because we had built a permanent classroom next to a permanent uh, Hindu monument. Um, and the local authority then put in a bus stop so that we got the bus service and so on. And people started building in bricks rather than tin. Yeah. Uh, and, so, and it became a, a, a suburb of the city uh, mm. with a place just because the the, 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 the Hindu um, monument and the school were next to each other, right in the centre of the settlement. It stimulated more permanent. And many of these settlements have gone, but this one has stayed. Um, and and, it, uh, and that was a home for 
uh, you know, we, we went right through from first year to to to, to diploma to um, postgraduate and to PhD. Well, that that process. I don't know how long that took, but that whole well, process. Well, I was just while you're thinking, I was just thinking about time. And when you ask us what what it looks like, um, it's it's difficult to say because I suppose one of the things, the ways that we work is that we and we offer a a very long term commitment to um, communities and NGOs and projects that we work on. So um, we haven't got a lot of projects, but they have run for sort of ten years at a time. Um, we tend to sp spend three years with our studio in one particular neighborhood for example or, or city but our, our live projects that run in parallel um tend to go on for about 10 years um and so the the project that morris just described with the school as he said started off with a very simple discussion about an eye clinic which then led to a brief for a, a small classroom rather than a school um the important point here being that um there wasn't a need for a, a school because there were schools, there were government um, funded state schools. And the issue was really that the migrant worker children didn't have addresses because they lived in informal settlements. So they therefore couldn't get access to state education. And by providing little classroom spaces, I think we did too in uh, this 15 kilometer stretch of quarry, um, they were able to get basic certificates um, that then gave them access to these schools. So it was a bridge, bridging um, class, uh, very basic structures that we constructed for sort of two and a half thousand pounds each. Um, students built them in about five weeks. Um, slightly going off thread here, but no, just go, to go back to your point about um, what it looks like, when we talk about the role of the architect as detective, narrator and craftsman, um, what I'm working on now at the moment in in our research is it sort of looks like this it's the architect as detective which could be seen as an interpretive mapping the architect as um, narrator um, is an urban imaginary and the architect as craftsman is some some built artifact or, or structure that gives back very directly to the communities um, in the time that we've been working um, with a number of um, communities and settlements and, and people around the world, we have, you know, learned a lot of lessons, things like understanding research fatigue, um, where, you know, we've had um, communities who felt that we haven't given back enough, you know, we've researched and researched, um, but they haven't seen anything tangible or, or felt that real sort of return to them. And I think the, the sort of making part, that's where the making part is really crucial in all of this, not only for um, educating architecture stu students, you know, in a way that gives them real experience, but in really engaging properly with communities and it becoming a mutual exchange rather than one-sided. Yeah, it's a really, it's a really fascinating idea. When you were speaking, Bo, I was minded of a book, <clears throat> probably one of my favourite books, um, which got nothing to do with architecture at all. Uh, called A Canticle for Leibovitz by an author called Walter Miller. And it is about this threefold thing that you do in a peculiar kind of way. Um, and I, 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 it's too complicated. Well, it's not complicated. It's an incredible story. Um, but it's, a, it's basically about this construction, I suppose, of culture and of knowledge in, in the, the, the book's case in the context of a post-nuclear apocalypse. And and the way that people work together to construct this thing. It's it's a book of absolute genius, I think. Probably the only book he, he actually the, the author actually wrote. But um but I was also thinking that when, when you were both were talking, that you 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 seem to be this temporal idea, and you put it in your notes to me. Um you called it a temporal slack to stimulate discourse. We fo we would like to focus on placemaking using, quote unquote, temporal slack, is a very nice phrase, to stimulate discourse, deliberation, and involvement in making at the neighborhood scale. And maybe we can come on to this issue of scale at, at, at another point, because it is the thing, I think for me, with all of these alternative practices, which is the sort of the elephant in the room, it's, it's like, um, how do you scale up? 
radical practice, and it's not been done very effectively very often. Um, Balakrishna Doshi may be the only guy that probably did it really well, um, of happy memory. But I was wondering, is, is the architecture, is this loose fit city, in a way, um, is it sort of dethroning architecture to make it a device for democratization, for dialogue, rather than the end in itself? Is the architecture just a means to an end? It's about creativity, um, which, I, which I'm sure most people who are architects or enjoy architecture would say that architecture is about. And uh, I think the argument would be that a lot of creativity is locked up uh, with, with uh, our recent um, practices of architecture and focused on the profession but to such an extent that it's incredibly narrow what good um, uh, creativity, what the creativity is, is good. What, mm. you know, what the, so it's over focused. And uh, just like we found that local materials are incredibly um, uh, a good resource that could be used and never, uh, that seldom are. And th those are not just the physical ones, but the cultural ones as well. Um, and so people are a lot richer if they, than they know, if only they know how to release that richness. Um, and, and that includes creativity. Uh, and a lot of uh, the so-called good creativity of architecture is actually useless and not, and not particularly creative at all. It's just within a very narrow set of people who say it's good or not. You know, it, it, yeah. it's like the crit has only got your best friends in it, you know. Um, and so, um, uh, so, so and the temporal slack, I mean, if you look at master plans, you find an area is master planned by a developer and it's approved and then nothing can happen unless it fits the master plan. And there isn't enough, there aren't enough resources. The local culture that exists is driven out. Um, and you have to wait for years before these, these master plans can be um, uh, built. And then when they're built, nobody lives there. So there's no culture. It's just empty. It's like, like these um, Chinese towns in Angola where they build these huge concrete towns and nobody's living there. Um, and to a lesser or, 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 or greater extent, that's what happens with master plans. Now, we, we use a word uh, compass direction rather than master plan. Um, with at any one time, we have an ambition and um, where we think this is the right direction. But we realize that this is also time limited and, and we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. We don't want to get rid of all the local materials, get rid of all the local culture, because we've got this idealized, idealized vision of what's good and what's appropriate. Um, and we're going to build that without enough resources and without ever testing whether that's true or not. So the other, th another thing that we want to, in our program is experimentation. We want to, people to be experimental, which is comes back to the craftsmanship, comes back to the hands-on, try things and see whether it happens at a small scale. And then, and then as it works, then you can uh, start to be a little bit bigger. But again, I would come back to you about this idea of um, scaling up. I think that is a, a factory based let's make more money by make, making more of these widgets and they're really cheap to make in a factory and we can only persuade people to use these widgets and we'll make a lot of money. So scaling up uh, means you don't need to do any more experimentation. We're just going to tell people this is what they need. They become solutions looking for problems. Um, and and uh, so we are not particularly uh, trying to scale up. We think that our ideas are scalable up, but not the object necessarily. And so you have... Um, what, what what do we call it, Bo? When you have um, uh, when when you have lots of pin pinpoint um, pinprick urbanism, pinprick urbanism. That's the word, and that was not invented by us, but it, uh, it's 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 the guy in uh, I can't remember where it is, but we could look that up. But the idea is that you have lots of little experimental things dotted around the city of working at the neighbourhood scale, like we are, or something very similar, and. And they become interconnected, and then the whole city is persuaded this is a way forward. Um, and so it goes along with recent computerized theory, which says that change happens at the margins, more at the center. So it's like do, if you want to cure cancer, do you have a massively gun, uh, uh, government funded program with a, a head and a hierarchy of managers, or do you just put the say what the problem is on the net? And people who are thinking about it around the world input it, and suddenly you have something that really works. So we would we challenge the idea of scaling up as as in terms of a factory, and argue that we need a change of culture, particularly in the architectural profession, which is failing and will die out unless this happens, in my view, or it'll just be a province of the rich. 
one or the other. I mean, architecture is in a dire state because of this approach. Um, yeah. and, and, and I think architects who want to be, want the profession to uh, continue and want to make a real contribution, they need to change. Mm. Um, and and that, that's the problem that I think we're coming across and trying to address. Yeah. Yes. Uh, do you have yes. something to add to this? I mean... Just to say that, um, you know, I agree with Morris, the, the master plan rejects time. Um, we don't engage with scaling up because we're very much into a place-based kind of architecture, um, which is a sort of reaction to the negative effect of, of you know, the sort of master plan or top-down imposition of something that is completely defined from beginning to end. Um, and the idea of, you know, replicating as well. Um, as an as a way of scaling up, um, but would you say this is a conflict? I mean, you've used in the notes to me, and and from what you were saying, Morris. I mean, there <clears throat> there is this idea of discourse, argumentation, creating conflict, and conflict obviously generates something new. Conflict is a device for prov provoking action. Yeah. which I think is really, like, I don't know, modernism uh, in the form that we have it now, and it's sort of, I call it capitalist vernacular. Um, it's sort of, you know, it's very difficult to argue with Richard Rogers's or Norman Foster's work because it actually contains, as I read it, no, it has no content at all. Mm. You know, right. it's, it's, it's incredibly banal fundamentally. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Because um, the uh, architecture uh, as performance is not allowed to happen. Um, uh, and, and, and so you, you start to produce stuff after the, it's inhabited and, and, and then diversity can happen. Mm. So it, it is only infrastructure for living. It's not architecture as performance. So mm. it's the, they're prote pretending that everything is permanent. Once you're building, everything is permanent. Mm. Um, and, and then you have to live in that and you make your own life within that. And insofar as it makes you do this or that, that that's, uh, you know, that's that's you don't have the freedom to knock a hole in the wall, paint a different color of the front door, uh, even put a picture on the wall because you're going to damage something that's so precious. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about going back to the temporal slack, I mean, the if things are all if you accept everything's changing all the time. You, th there is time for these conversations, for these uh, this agon. If you have a master plan, uh, you just stop time until the money comes or until it's built, and then you have to build the culture as well. So there is time to do these conversations. It's just the way the society is organised. Um, you can't because it's 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 it, it's individualised. The life is individualised, and you don't need to talk to other people because this infrastructure is there. You slot into it like a. Uh, drawer into a chest of drawers and and you you take it or leave it in that situation so the the opportunity to talk to your neighbor and to come up with something at that scale um is denied you mm. yes. we've always seen landscapes as uh being sort of made and remade and that ongoing process so if we consider the element of time then and the fact that we're dealing with unfinished landscapes and buildings rather than you know but that, that that's the key to unlocking the potential and harnessing the affordances that are presented to you by a particular landscape um, and its occupants. And, and then that offers opportunities for unlocking the resources that are available locally in that place mm. in order to make a proposal that then fits, um, fits it. It's like what, what you're saying, <clears throat> this idea of time, the way that we uh, approach the, our great architects, living and just not living, is the objects that they produce are undeniable. They're extraordinary. I mean, the scale of them, the kind of razzmatazz, the virtuosity in terms of its structure, often enough not detailing and, and not how they sit down on the ground, but, but certainly, I mean, but that, but that's something that we have become over the course of the late 20th century fixated upon this idea of the object building, the building that is only that which you apprehend as an object. And rather than, as you say, this idea of a performative or, or, or temporal architecture. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, Bo, if you would talk a little bit more about this idea of making, because 
Um, obviously, this is the the third aspect, the craftsman's uh, um, way of of going, and 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 Morris has talked about this idea of craft as a as a mechanism for testing ideas quickly in a shared environment. And in the notes that you sent me, you talked about it as an example of practical wisdom in action. I thought maybe you could talk about maybe, that. maybe some examples from the book that that might might illustrate that. There are a number of examples in the book that um, come from the way of building course that we've run at CAT, which Morris, I think, started in the, when was it, 70s, 80s, 80s, most, um, and has sort of run annually ever since. And we've there's been various iterations of it uh, within our course. And actually, next weekend, we're teaching it with a group of students from UEL. So um, you but teach that, at CAT as well, do you? Uh, well, we run this annual a short course which is open to the public and it's called a way of building um, where they use locally sourced materials from around the site and they build in groups in uh, little um, building elements so one material one building element and it comes together at the end of the four four days to, to construct as an assembly um, and um, so I suppose it, it, it's an ongoing research topic of ours, this idea of learning by doing in terms of architectural education, live projects. And, and we also, this uh, the CAT model has been adopted um, by colleagues of ours as well um, at London Met um, on, on a site at, at Mudshoot Farm and on the Isle of Dogs. So we run that course with second years, a similar version of the course with second years where they work with the material for one week mm -hmm. to build the structure. Um, but the idea of learning by doing is a sort of heuristic process of, um, explicit intention, which is then followed by contextual resistance, um, which requires in turn then an accommodation of intent. And that's a sort of cyclical process of, by which you learn through doing, through using your hands and making. Um, and that, you know, that sort of happens in the architectural um, environment, um, ed educational environment at a, a sort of one to one scale, but usually focus on a building element, but we we take the same idea in our live projects as well, um, in the schools that we've built um, around the world and and the, you know, sanitation and infrastructure projects, the, the first project ever, you know, um, but it was Bo, probably- Bo would, Bo, would you repeat that? The first project you ever did and then your voice disappeared. Ah, okay, sorry. The first project, live project I ever did um, was, a toilet, um, you know, building a toilet, but it's probably the most important um, project that I ever did. Um, we had a lot of um, resistance um, to the idea of even putting toilets in a settlement in Nagra because they were considered dirty. Mm -hmm. um, so it took a lot of um, engagement with the community, um, a lot of discussions, a lot of um, getting to understand people and hearing their stories and how they live and um, to really understand how to go about doing this project, which the NGO was really wanting to make happen. And I think we spent, a group of us as students, fourth year students spent five weeks in Agra and we built five toilets, um, very basic septic tank toilets, which we'd um, worked with local fabricators who were used to building sewage pipes to construct, um, leaving the option for householders to um, sort of design their own superstructures. So the toilet and the washing structures um, were based on their, their income, you know, what they could afford and what they wanted. So some just had a platform, others had a full toilet with a metal door, some just had a cloth over um, to, for privacy. Um, but they could be adapted over time, they could be personalised. And we saw that happen, um, you know, by the time I'd gone back to India, sort of five, six years later, there were all sorts of ornate toilet structures, you know, it was a status symbol at that point. We went from, you know, nobody believing that having a toilet in your house was a good thing to everybody wanting one. And, and I think 200 toilets came out of that project. Um, we were not involved in that um, beyond the pilot because it, it worked in a revolving community credit fund. So that just kept going as people pe repaid the um, loans for their superstructure, for their um, superstructures, other people could take out loans to build theirs. And um, it's quite, um, a success story for us, I suppose, that from five toilets, 200 have emerged and we, we didn't have to do anything. Um, 
because really, you know, there isn't the time and energy for, for me to go and build 200 myself. Um, you don't, right. want, you're, you're, you, <laughs> you don't want to end up being like Amritid Shanks of oh, <laughs> the toilet specialist. I mean, well, that's not that's not something to have on your tombstone, I don't think. But um, I was also thinking, so there's something very bodily about the architecture that you're talking about. And it's almost like part of this making process is also teaching students, but also people, ordinary non-architectural people to to recognize their body as a kind of site register, something, a measurement device for sites. Is that, like, is that a fair thing? Is that is that part of what this is, this making process, this kind of detective work? It's about engaging with sites in a, in a fulsome sensory sensual way. Well, there, there, it also comes to scale, doesn't it? Because if you're um, if you're using dimension, you uh, using body parts as the dimension is is not unusual. Um, e even uh, modernists like Corbusier. So um, the, the, it's also so it's also part of um, analysis. Um, and so that you're so it's it's your and your five senses are part of the body as well. So you can um, if you're um, being a, a detective. It, in in the place and you want to uh smell things taste things and so forth and uh, all your five senses and your psychology you know whether you are frightened here or whether you feel at home those are all measuring devices as well as how far you can reach and um uh, and, and the other things for measuring a, a facade um so yes that it, 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 and then and then of course there's a the yoga of uh craftsmanship and how you saw and hammer um and uh so you know rather than taekwondo being based on some sort of fighting skill, uh, craft becomes a, um, a making skill that is also very much a bodily thing. And um, uh, if we've lost out on that as a uh, people um, not uh, making things, um, we would like to bring that back because it's very much part of being alive and living and being a happy person is having the opportunity, but not, not forced to, but having the opportunity uh, to use your five senses and your body to enjoy what you're doing it's part of uh, it's part of that idea of performance mm. in, in the infrastructure performing in the infrastructure includes changing the props for the performance as you go along um and so that's quite neatly brings us on to scale i think if you yeah to... yeah yeah i mean i'm i'm interested in that i was thinking about this idea as well of the body and this idea of building loos yeah. Uh, is it's also a political thing. So this it's not just about a kind of materialist, uh, late phenomenological idea about engaging with the like texture of the sight man and the yeah. smell of the sight. But you know, if you're building toilets and people don't understand, mm. Ar Arjun Apadurai talks about the politics of shit. Yeah. And, you know, it's a highly political thing, and the fact that poor people don't get to have a toilet. Yeah. And that they've become incultured, you know, incultured with this idea that toilets are disgusting. Mm. You, but, all, but, of a, but, all of a sudden, you're opening up that dimension of the site as well. Yeah, I mean, with the, I mean, the reason for people objecting to building a toilet in their house was from the women, because the, women, the only time we get to meet other women and get out of the house is when we go into the fields yeah. to wash and, and poo. And therefore we meet other, and we've got men. We don't have to deal with men because they don't come there. Uh, although there is a bit of problems. There was a worry about them being attacked on the way there and back. But they were first said, no, we, we don't want it in the house. We, I'll never get out of here. I would need to go and yeah. out in the fields. And so that was something that was addressed at that level in the in the meeting, in mm -hmm. the in, in the group. They needed to find a problem to that solution rather than stopping having toilets. And that was something that was aired. You know, I mean, that's that was how, the direction that... that that this question about should we have internal toilets? Um, I mean, ultimately, it, it was one woman in the community, a woman called Mira, who became a sort of hero, um, who, you know, against all custom, put her hand up and said, I'll have the first one. Um, and she did that knowing she would have all sorts of judgment from the neighbours and from um, other residents. But as soon as her toilet was in, that you know the neighbors were peering over the fence and and suddenly we had 10 people signing up all at yeah. once and then you know it all snowballed from there so sometimes it just takes that bravery of one person to yeah. make that leap so what is this about scale how do you see this segue morris with well, 
Yes, um, it's it's also a, a, where you're where you're coming where you're looking from. You know, it's her, it's, it's horizon as well. Where, where is your horizon? Where are you? In t- again, space and time, both bo- both those. You know, where what is your imaginary um, aiming at? Uh, what from what direct? Where are you looking from? Um, and uh, so, and that and that question of scaling up that we dealt with before is all part of that production and so forth. Um, and so, do you make um, what do you make in a factory? I mean, nails and screws, of course, we're not going to make our own nails unless we're in a very, uh, because that, if you have nails and screws, you can be more creative because you can do things fast enough to nail things together. Yeah. But, you, but, but concrete cladding panels, perhaps an, a bit big and a bit heavy and a bit expensive and difficult to, 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 to transport. So they should be, uh, you know, fac- factory produced goods should be, in our opinion, uh, light, loose fit, cheap, um and um you know every, everybody should want them not not just one or two um so uh i get I, I do think factory production has um as well as many many benefits has had this effect of uh, taking us away from the bodily thing we we're talking about and the creativity thing that we we're talking about yeah um, so so that's that's to do with um the the scale of production related to factory production um, but I also think that we need to be very much aware of where wh- our position, where we're looking from. Um, do are we thinking of the uh, the city? Are we thinking about the neighbourhood? Are we just thinking about our house? Um, and are we coming from the point of view of the ma- the, the builder or the the occupier of how long? Um, and not you know we don't talk about these in architectural education. It's 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 a it's 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 something which um, is missing. I think in, in many senses, I think if, if architecture still is going in 50 to 100 years time, we'll see this is a real dark age. Because mm. there's so, you know, especially with um, uh, the, the academic discourse, wanting to wanting subjects that can be made into academic subjects where you can have theories, where you can test those theories, where you can do research, which 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 can be test, uh, uh, tested. Uh, and what we talk about in architecture is still you know, ephemeral and um, very much opinionated. And we don't really recognize that that's coming from us or a very small circle of people. And if you look, for example, um, you know, we in architecture like concrete on the surface of it. I do. I, I know because I've been taught to. Uh, but I know everybody who isn't an architect I've talked to thinks concrete is really ugly. You know, and and uh, I like bricks as well. But I mean, and I can't for what I say. It's, and I can't, I can't justify it. You know, it's just uh, it's a. Uh, it's that sort of narrowness that we 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 just can't take. They, we think they're wrong, you know. That we, mm-hmm. Concrete is beautiful. You just can't see it. And uh, and but I, a- I had a very inst- uh, instructive moment um, at a crit recently, where um, a student had been making a model of the Aylesbury estate, and um, he said, you know, he was asked what did he think about the de- demolition of it, and he said, well, seventy five percent of the people there wanted it, their own homes to be demolished, so maybe we should trust them. And the immediate response was, yes, but they're wrong. Yeah, exactly. And I thought it was just fascinating. It was just like this wonderful, wonderful moment where we've got a student and we are cultivating them into a, a prig to all intents and purposes. <laughs> it's really bad. But I, I just wanted to, I wanted to finish on this idea of narrative. And I thought that perhaps, Bo, you might want to talk about this is like, what do we do with narrative? And why is narrative an, an insp- the, 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 the fulcrum between these two, the detective and the maker? Um, I suppose it acts as a tool of both the research and the practice. Mm-hmm. Um, you said in your notes, helping to assemble a local narrative of change to which a sufficient number of local residents aspire and creating a visual representation and continuing imaginary of these aspirations. I like that this idea that that narrative is a way of articulating sort of submerged motivations and values within communities. Yes, I suppose narrative has come out of a sort of rejection of the idea of interview um, because it's much more dynamic. And when you're when you're trying to engage with, say, people and there's a language barrier, mm. immediately you've got a problem um, when it comes to just understanding. Um, and the, the interviews are so loaded with... Um, assumptions you know when when you say i'm going to interview somebody Mm -hmm. it's it's a 
that there's already an assumption that they've got to say the right thing. There's a, there's a right answer to give you. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you ask them, I mean, narrative is very connected to story stories and storytelling, and um, there are um, real stories. So you know, understanding um, narrative through um, people's own stories, through um, stories that have been passed down um, through generations, and and all of these come together um, to. F- um, if you in, in the right way, if they can come together in the right way to form a narrative, then that gives you a starting point um, for which to move forward. Yeah, and it also allows um, you to place yourself as an architect because if you want to find the most interesting work, and I'm not talking about the most highly paid, um, the, the the narrative will give you an indication. It's usually where the top down and bottom up meet. And and, uh, and and there's a sort of agon between the two. So you may have a local narrative that's been developed and then there's the, there's the city plan and the city approach and you're what you're placing yourself at that nexus with a real small project. Um, that that that's I think where architects would learn the most when they're just qualified. Uh, I think that that's a place for a young uh, ambitious architect to place themselves. And as again, I'm not talking about how you get mo- most paid, but it's where you would learn the most and where you would be the most make the greatest contribution. Fabulous. I think we can stop there. That's a brilliant point to stop on. Thank you very much, Bo. Thank you very much, Morris. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you very much for having us. Yes, thank you very much indeed for having podcasts. It's a wonderful uh, opportunity to be able to uh, spout off for, for an hour. Lovely jubbly. Just very lovely, really. Rather exciting, too. Thanks to Bo and Morris for working with me on this episode, for taking so much time helping to develop it. Please see the podcast description for links to Morris and Bo's professional profile. Of course, links to the book itself on their Outledge website. It's fantastic. You should buy it. And please share this episode far and wide. Thanks for listening. Cheers. Cheers.